Thank you, Keith, uh, for the nice introduction. And uh, I appreci appreciate Wolf River Conservancy having me on this series. Um, just give a little plug for the organization. They're one of my favorite nonprofits. And when I first heard about Wolf River Conservancy, I remember thinking that they had a tremendous uphill battle ahead of them to try to you know, preserve land along the Wolf River and the expanding uh, Memphis area. And I, I'm just blown away by the work they've done. And it's floating the Wolf River is the best float trip around. And every time I float it, I'm so grateful to this organization. So I really appreciate them having me. So let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen here. It said host disabled participant screen sharing. Hey, Matt, can you enable Susie's? Go ahead, Susie. Uh, Sorry about that. Okay. 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 So uh, when Kathy asked me to do this talk, she asked me to give an introduction to crayfish. So here is your introduction to crayfish. This is crayfish, also called crawfish, crawdad, mud bug, and a few other names. Um, so now you've been introduced and, um, if you have any questions, feel free. Oh, wait, hang on. Oh, they wanted me to tell you more than that. Okay. I guess I will. So, uh, Keith gave me a great introduction, but, um, the first time I gave a talk at a professional society meeting, um, my fellow grad students and I were all super nervous and we were all like dressed up in our best professional clothes and, at the end of the session, the moderator said, you know, we know that you guys don't look like this most of the time. We wanna see pictures of what you look like when you're doing your work. So here's the pictures of what I look like doing my work. Um, so as mentioned, the way this, this is gonna to go tonight is I'm gonna talk a little bit about diversity of crayfish, but, and that includes like species diversity, but also diversity in habitats and um, behaviors that allow them to live in different habitats. And then I'll talk about just a very little bit about their biology and life cycle, and then go into their ecological importance and then talk about threats to and from crayfish. And then we'll bring it home to the Wolf River drainage and I'll show you some of the species that occur here. So throughout the talk, um, I have some poll questions scattered throughout. So um, Matt, if we can have the first question. So this, so you can just click on the, on your preferred answer. And then after you click on it, um, I think you have to X out. There's an X in the upper right of the box that you have to click on. And so we'll just leave that up there for a minute. And this is a way for me to get an idea of, you know, of what, how much, how much experience you all have had with crayfish. Okay, so so three fourths of you said you've caught a crawfish before, and I'm guessing that for a number of you, it's been a few decades since you did that, but that's okay. <laughs> so for those of you that haven't, I think after this talk, you'll be ready to run out and catch them. Okay, so to talk about the global diversity of crayfish, first I'll just, these pictures, um, the one on the left is from Australia and the one on the right is from Papua New Guinea. And when I got this slide, um, it wasn't a described species yet, and it's since been described. Um, but in order to talk about the diversity of crayfish, first we should talk about what a crayfish actually is. And my slides are now not advancing. Here we go. Okay. So this woman is, has a lobster on the table and says, I can't, cannot eat with that disgusting arthropod here looking at a cockroach on the floor. But in fact, Cockroaches and lobsters are all arthropods, as are spiders and insects and crayfish. And so um, if you remember high school biology, where you had to memorize kingdom phylum class order family genus species, um, the order that crayfish are in is decapoda. And so they're related to shrimps, crabs, and lobsters. And their closest relatives are the clawed lobsters. And 
they diverged from the marine lobsters about 330 million years ago, so a while back. And there's four families of crayfish and three of them are in the Northern Hemisphere and one in the Southern Hemisphere and that those two groups diverged about 265 million years ago. And so that was during the Permian period before the age of dinosaurs. And um, this red dot on the map on the left shows Memphis and what it was like in relation to the landmass 260 million years ago. So you can see that it was quite the different place at that time. And so when that landmass split up then the Northern and, and Southern hemisphere crayfish diverged. Um, and part of the reason that they're so different is that there's not really very many crayfish in the tropics. And there's a lot of um, reasons that have been bandied about for that, but some people think it's because they've been ecologically replaced by freshwater crabs and shrimps in the tropics. Um, so this, this map shows the distribution of the four families of crayfish. And so you can see all the shaded areas are the places that have native crayfish. And so they're on every continent except for the mainland of Africa and Antarctica. Okay. So I think this is, hang on. Oh, I can't go backwards. Okay. So the next pop-up is how many crayfish species live in Tennessee? I was gonna to try to show you this before I showed you the map, but I messed up. <laughs> okay, so 20 has the most votes and 60 to 65 has the, the next most. So we're gonna come back to this answer in a little bit. So I'm sorry, I don't have a flashier map to show you, but this, um, this map is a couple years old and the numbers of species are a little bit off because people have continued to describe crayfish species, but the big picture is still the same where most crayfish in the world live in North America, followed by Australia and Papua New Guinea. Um, and within, the, within North America, most of the diversity is in the Southeastern US. So the Southeastern US has the highest species diversity of crayfish in the whole world. And even though we far surpass Australia in the number of species, um, they have some pretty incredible diversity there, including the biggest crayfish in the world, the Tasmanian giant crayfish, Astacopsis gouldi. And these get to be, now they get to be about 11 pounds. Um, historically, they got to be more, or closer to 17 pounds. But as, um, they've been over harvested and obviously, you know, they, they have to be pretty old to get this big. And so when there's a lot of harvest, they can't get to their full size. So they don't get as big as they used to. But the guy holding this is Todd Walsh and he's pretty much single-handedly spearheaded the effort to get these listed as an endangered species in Australia. And I asked him what would happen if you got pinched by one of these, and I don't know whether to believe him or not, but he told me that a large adult can break a man's forearm. So that made me glad that I'm working on smaller species. Okay, and Australia also claims to have the smallest crayfish in the world, this Tenui branchiura species, but I'm not convinced that that's the case. Um, these on the lower right are Camborellus. That's a genus called dwarf crayfishes that live in the southeastern US. And I'm sorry the picture's blurry, but these are adult Camborellus leslii. And there's one, one other species of Camborellus that's even smaller than these. And so I haven't taken the time to actually compare me measurements with the Australian ones, but I think that we have the smallest crayfish in the world. Okay, now this, these maps are based on um, some work that I participated in with the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which is the group that does the IUCN Red List. And they reassessed all of the crayfish species in the world to look at um, how their, their level of endangerment. 
And so the two maps on the left show global hotspots of threatened crayfish species. So the darker the shading, the more species there are. So you can see that the southeastern US, part of Mexico and southeast Australia have really high levels of threatened crayfish species. And then the maps on the right are showing data deficient species. And what that means is that the species didn't even have enough information for us to apply the red list criteria to figure out if they were threatened or not. And so the take home here is that the southeastern US not only has a ton of diversity, but it has a ton of work that needs to be done to better understand the crayfish that we have and their conservation status. So this, uh, the table on the left is shows all the genera of crayfish in the US and or in North America. And it shows the number of species in North America <laughs> for a each. Seat in a bag. Um, and then the, the yellow highlights are the genera that are in Mississippi. And I don't know, I think that Tennessee probably has a few genera that Mississippi doesn't, but I'm not sure. Okay, now remember how many species you thought there were in Tennessee. So most people thought 20 and then 60 to 65. But in fact, there's over 90. Um, so Mississippi has about 63 and um, Alabama has 99. I'm trying to find my, my book to show you. Um, a great new book just came out called Crayfishes of Alabama. And if you have more than a passing interest in crayfish, you should get this book, it's incredible. Um, but two people, Jeff Simmons and Carl Williams are working on crayfishes of Tennessee and they're gonna publish a checklist of all the species, but they can't, they don't wanna publish it until they finish um, looking at the taxonomy of a few groups. And there's at least three species complexes. So they're working on describing more species, but they did hint that they might end up with more species than Alabama. So I just, that's why I just put greater than 90 there. Okay, so that covers the species diversity. So let's talk about diversity and habitats and behaviors that let crayfish live in different habitats. So I don't think anybody would be surprised to know that crayfish live in still water as well as flowing water and they live in big water and little water. So they can live anywhere from huge lakes to small streams. But I think what's more surprising to people is that is the um, gradient of water permanence that they live in. So clearly they live in habitats that where the water never dries up, but they also live in temporary waters such as this roadside ditch or intermittent spring streams or um, like vernal pools on floodplains. And then beyond that even, they live in places like um, coastal plain prairies and longleaf pine savannas. So this, um, this is a pitcher plant prairie in Southern Mississippi in this picture. And you know you can walk out there and it's, it's completely dry, but there's crayfish living in burrows there. And I think a lot of people don't realize that crayfish will live in those kinds of habitats. And then they'll also live in springs and caves. And so some crayfish that are mostly uh, on the surface will also you know, move into caves sometimes, but there's also cave adapted species like this one. Um, and I, a lot of the photos of, in here are from um, Gunter, Sch Gunter Schuster, who did the photos in Crayfishes of Alabama. And so I appreciate him letting me use these. But this is a crayfish from a cave in Lauderdale County, Alabama. And you can see so it has no coloration and its eyes are really reduced and not, you know, they're, they're not functional eyes. Okay, so how are crayfish able to live in places with no water? And generally it's because they burrow. And often when crayfish burrow, they build these, uh oh, I need to go back. Oh, it worked this time. Uh, they build these towers of, that are made of balls of clay and we call those chimneys. And so the chimney, it can be a single chimney or a double chimney. And 
sometimes, so after it rains, then the chimney just kind of erodes and it starts to look more like a volcano. And eventually it'll just look like a flat area of mud. And you can't even tell that there's a hole there. Um, and then other times there's just an open hole, like you can see here um, with no chimney whatsoever. And a single burrow can have all, all three of these types of openings or lack of openings. So um, crayfish burrowing habits have been categorized in different ways by different people, but generally they're split into three burrowing categories. And so we'll start with the tertiary burrowers um, are ones that are, they spend most of their life in open water. And when things get rough, like if it dries up on a rare occasion or it freezes, or sometimes when the females have eggs, they'll dig a simple burrow and spend time in there, but usually it's just a small straight burrow. Then secondary burrowers are ones that spend part of their life in open water and part in um, their burrows. And so those would be species like the red swamp crayfish that you would get at a crawfish boil usually. And so they, like in aquaculture situations, they'll flood rice fields and the, the crawfish will live out there, then they'll trap them, drain the field, plant the rice, and the crayfish that are left out there will go into their burrows. And then finally, there's the primary burrowers and those are ones that they either never are found in open water or just for a very limited time, usually when they're releasing their offspring. And they have the most complex burrows in general. And so they're, like you can see in this top part of the picture, their burrows will have multiple channels and they'll have multiple openings. And so like one opening might have a chimney and another one might just be open and another one might be a plugged hole. And then they'll have different resting chambers at different levels. And as the groundwater goes down, they'll burrow deeper. And so even though they have these multiple um, lateral tunnels, usually they only have one tunnel that goes down deep. And this is an example of a burrow of a primary burrower that I excavated um, in Southern Mississippi. Sorry, my other computer's making noise. Um, and I just put the red line here so that you can see the path of the burrow better. So you can see it winds all over the place and maybe there was a few chambers here and there, but there would have only been one place where the burrow went straight down and they can go deeper than six feet down in some cases, which is not a cool thing if you're trying to dig them out. Okay, and so over the decades, there's been conversation among scientists about, well, first of all, whether they build these um, chimneys intentionally or whether they're just an artifact of trying to get mud out of the burrow. And I, th I think it's pretty well settled that they're intentional. Um, and then the conversation goes to, well, what's the purpose of them? And I love this, this poem I found by a kid on the internet that said, crayfish build chimneys so their voices will echo when they sing. And, you know, it turns out it might not be quite so far from the truth. So, um, there's a scientist um, named Jim Steckel who works at Auburn University. And he's done some work trying to figure out just what the purpose of, of the chimneys is. And his preliminary results suggest that they help the air circulate um, through and out of the burrow in such a way that the pheromones are spread you know, over the landscape. And so it looks like it's, um, it provides a way for them to communicate with crayfish in other burrows which I think is a pretty cool thing. Okay, so that's, that's it for the diversity part. I want to give you the, the extremely short version of crayfish biology, mostly just looking at um, their life cycle. So if you want to wow your friends at your next crawfish boil, the first thing you need to do is learn how to tell a male from a female. So Crayfish have these sort of feathery appendages on the underside of their ab abdomen that are called pleopods. And on male crayfish, the, the first two pairs of pleopods are modified into these long structures. And the first the structure on the first pair is ca are called gonopods. And they're used in reproduction. And for the all of the crayfish east of the continental divide, those gonopods are really important for identifying crayfish. 
And then males will often also have these hooks on one or two pairs of legs. Um, so that's another, another way to tell a male from a female. And then the females, sometimes they'll have a, a small vestigial like gonopod, but usually there's, there's just a pleopod, I mean, a, yeah, a pleopod here that looks like the other ones. And then they have an annulus ventralis. And that is a place that they store the sperm and the male. So the male will deposit the sperm and put a, like a waxy plug over it. And remarkably, they can, the females can store that sperm for months. And then when they're ready to exude their eggs, the eggs come out of a pore at the base of their third pair of legs. So they release their eggs. And you can see these white, um, along the underside of the tail, there's these white patches and in the tail fan. And that, those are called glare glands and they contain a sticky substance. And so when they release their eggs, they also release glare and they use that to stick the eggs onto their pleopods. Um, so it's a pretty remarkable thing. And the other, the other important aspect of the fact that they can store sperm is that if one female crayfish is released into a place that it shouldn't be released and it is storing sperm, then there's potential for that single crayfish to start a population of non-native species. Okay, and this is what it looks like when they have eggs. These are two different species that we dug out of burrows um, in January of 2020 in South Mississippi. And you can see that they're, so they're both in burrow, burrows, but the one on the right, on the right hand picture, has like fewer bigger eggs and the one on the left has a lot more small eggs. And they'll keep these eggs on their abdomen until they hatch. And then when they hatch into the cutest little cralings you've ever seen, um, those cralings are still attached to the female by a thread. And then after they molt for the first couple of molts, they'll still attach to her with their little claws and they'll go off and feed and then come back and attach again. And usually after about the third molt, um, they'll disperse. And if they don't, then mom might eat them. So let that be a lesson to any kids out there. Um, the exception to that is the, bur the primary burrowers, which sometimes will keep two generations of um, offspring in the burrow with them. And this is just a picture through, taken through a dissecting scope of a newly hatched cradling. Okay, so this is just sort of a generalized life, life history pattern of crayfish. Um, so they might mate in the fall and then say in late winter to early spring, the female will secrete and fertilize her eggs and then she'll incubate them on, under her abdomen. And usually during that time, she's hidden away. She's in a burrow or she's in a pile of wood or um, maybe in a root wad or something. And then in the spring, the juveniles are released and they go through a period of really rapid growth. And because they, like all arthropods, because they have a hard exoskeleton, the only way they can grow is by molting. So they have to shed their exoskeleton to get bigger. Um, so when they're small, they'll do that multiple times, you know, like maybe six times in a year or more. Um, and then when they're mature, it starts over again. And so it depends on the species, on how long it takes to mature. And so the dwarf crayfishes that I mentioned earlier, they can mature, they easily mature in their first year. Whereas some of the cave crayfish might take four or five years to reach maturity. And the other thing that I wanted to say is that some genera in the south have a, a shift in the timing of this pattern. So like maybe their mating would be in the spring and their juveniles would be released um, in the late summer. And there's also a lot of variation within species. So you might sign some being released in the spring and some in the fall, but all in the same species. Okay, so this gets us to the question of why are crayfish important? And as an ecologist and a human being who loves nature, I think that all species are important um, just for their inherent value. 
but I realize that as a taxpayer funded biologist, I need to have an answer to this question that's, that speaks to more people. So um, I'll talk about a couple of, a few aspects of why crayfish are important to humans. So the first is because they taste good and there's cultures in different parts of the world that highly value crayfish as food. Um, I've been lucky enough to be part of an organiza international organization of crayfish biologists and we have meetings all over the world. And so um, on the right are crayfish that we were given in Finland. And so they're just, um, they serve them with dill and some salt and it's pretty simple. And then the ones on the left were from Spain. Um, not many of you have seen a traditional Southern uh, crawfish boil. So it's a much different um, sort of experience than this. Um, but so not only do they taste good, which makes them culturally important, but it also makes them economically important. Okay, so poll question number three. Which species can most people safely eat? And I said most people, because my mom who's on here, hi mom, um, if they have a crustacean allergy, shouldn't like to lobster, they shouldn't be eating crayfish. All of them, 86%, yes, you did well. <laughs> um, you can eat any, any species of crayfish, but the caveat is that the reason they have, so most of the meat is in the tail, and the reason they have um, a muscular tail is because that's what they use to escape predators in water. So if you've ever startled a crayfish, you've probably seen it shoot backwards, and they do that by doing a tail flip. They flip their tail under, and that um, propels them backwards. But crayfish and burrows don't need to do that. And so they have big beefy bodies, but very skinny tails. And it's already a lot of work to get a crayfish out of a burrow. And if you get it out and it's got this little skinny tail, it's really not gonna be worth eating. Okay, crayfish can also be economically important because of damage that they cause. So this is a picture of a yard in South Alabama. And you can see that there's burrow chimneys all over the place. And some people, for some strange reason, object to this in their yard. Um, I would love to have this in my yard, but that's a different story. Um, they can also cause problems burrowing into dikes or dams because they can eventually cause you know, leakage through the, the structure. Um, and then invasive crayfish can cause economic harm, like for example, by um, damaging um, like sport fisheries. And so we'll talk about that more in a little bit. And then crayfish are important because of the roles that they play in ecosystems. And so you might look at a couple of these pictures and think, hmm, what does that have to do with crayfish? Well, I will tell you that first of all, I'll talk about the burrowers. So one thing that's really cool, I think, is that there's a number of other species that use crayfish burrows. Um, so there's a northern crawfish frog here in the picture in a crayfish burrow. But there's also there's a couple of um, species, a snake and a dragonfly larva that are both endangered species that depend on crayfish burrows for their to complete their life cycle. So if the crayfish go away, then those species will also go away. And then also, um, I think their burrowing activity in and of itself um, is an important ecosystem function. And there's not a lot of research that's been done into this, but there's places in um, South, South Mississippi that you can hardly take a step without stepping on a crawfish chimney. And so you can imagine that all of that burrowing is rototilling the soil, it's aerating it, it's distributing um, nutrients throughout the soil, it's affecting the hydrology of the site. And really not very much work at all has been done on this, but I think that there's probably some important interactions between crayfish burrowing and some of the plants that live in these environments. And I would love to um, get a chance to work on that more. And then we're not the only species that thinks that 
crayfish taste good. So what eats crayfish? Well, everything. That's a little bit of an exaggeration, but pretty much if an animal can eat a crayfish, it will eat a crayfish. And we'll I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. And what do crayfish eat? Well, they eat pretty much everything they can too, um, including other crayfish. So um, this is like one of the only really nerdy slides I have in here, but this is by Bob DiStefano um, and it's a simplified food web from an Ozark stream in Missouri. Um, and I'm just gonna point out a few things on this. And so the arrows show like who's eating who, okay? So crayfish are eating detritus and microbes directly and they're shredding leaves that are in the streams, but they're also eating animals that are eating those things. So right there, that's two different trophic positions that they're taking there. They're eating the stuff directly and they're eating the animals that eat those. Um, they'll eat aquatic plants and algae directly and they'll eat the animals that eat those. Um, and then in turn, they're eaten by other animals. And so Bob has smallmouth bass on here because it's an important sport fish and crayfish are their main food source. Um, but what this doesn't show is that crayfish also eat fish. And so maybe they'll eat small or juvenile smallmouth bass and other small species, um, and as well as eating other crayfish. So they're, they're very important in aquatic food webs. And then they also have a big um, indirect effect on their environment through what they eat. So some, some species of crayfish eat a lot of aquatic plants and there's a species called the rusty crayfish that's been widely introduced, um, and I'll show you a map in a bit, but widely introduced into the upper Midwest and the Northeast, and it eats a lot of aquatic plants. And so these pictures are all the places where rusty crayfish are introduced. And in the top left picture, um, you can see that that one part of it has a lot of plants, and that was in a, an exclosure that kept crayfish from getting in there. And so then the biologists went in and they took the they removed the rusty crayfish from these habitats and took pictures again. And these are the same sites after the rusty crayfish were removed. Um, the same thing has happened where crayfish have been introduced in lakes in Japan and elsewhere in the world. Um, and these plant, these, um, yeah, these aquatic plant beds are super important as nurseries for sport fish and other fish, for snails and insects. And so by removing those, those weed beds, it really changes the whole ecosystem. Um, and then crayfish are also really important links between aquatic and terrestrial food webs, both because they'll come out of the water, but there's a lot of uh, uh, terrestrial animals that eat them while they're in the water. Um, and I, I meant to say that a number of photos in here are not my photos, but, and I've tried to keep, to uh, give credit to the people that took the photos, but a few of them I've lost track of that. So like, this is an incredible photo and I don't know who took it. Um, but when crayfish have been introduced to areas where there haven't been crayfish historically, uh, there's been a couple studies that have shown that it really alters how nutrients move from aquatic to, uh, to terrestrial systems. So one of the things I've been working on is doing a literature review of trying to um, summarize everything that's been documented as eating crayfish in North America. And so far, um, I'm up to 112 fish species, 111 birds, 56 reptiles and amphibians, 14 mammals, and at least 15 invertebrates, including insects and spiders. Um, and the thing is, people, these, these have to be huge undercounts because very little work's been done on what most invertebrates eat. And in case you're not into quick mental math, that's over 300 species that have already been documented as eating crayfish. And, and for some of these species, in, including some birds and reptiles and fish, um, they depend on crayfish. That's one of, one of their main diet sources. Okay. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about some threats to crayfish and a little bit of about threats from crayfish. Um, and this is important to conservation to understand what's 
what's causing declines in populations. And I don't want to dwell on it too much because it can be depressing, but I think it's important to be aware of. So the first thing is not um, a human caused threat, it's just a natural condition where um, a lot of crayfish species are narrow endemics, which mean they only live in a certain area. So these two species shown in this slide, for example, are from central Mississippi, and both of them only live in little corners of two or three counties in the state. Um, and there's no reason to believe that they used to be a lot more widespread than that. Um, and we might learn that we're still looking at the bottom species to try to understand if it's more widespread than we thought it was. Um, but that, that natural small range is a threat in and of itself because it means that you know if something happens to a small area, then that species could go extinct. Um, and there are species that are even more endemic than this. So um, there's some species that are only known from one cave or one spring. And so that's a little nerve wracking to be in charge of uh, preserving a species that's only in one tiny area. So the first um, human caused threat that I'll mention is habitat alteration. And this can come in many forms. And probably the most typical is like urbanization you know, if you build a shopping center in a wetland, it's probably not gonna be very good for the crayfish that live there. Um, but the example I am showing here is a, some, one that people might not think of as much about. So some of the primary burrowing crayfish, especially in um, along the Gulf Coast are adapted to these um, areas that have had frequent fire. So they historically, prehistorically had fire every two or three years and then when people came along and decided they didn't want their backyard burning up, they started suppressing fire and putting fires out. And as soon as you do that in these areas, you start to get forest encroachment and you get trees and woody shrubs moving in very quickly. And for some of these crayfish species, as soon as those woody plants start moving in, the crayfish disappear. Um, I think the next one that probably would occur to a lot of people is pollution and really don't think that we know a whole lot about how various sorts of pollution affect most crayfish species. And, it, and I think it does very much differ by species. Um, some are probably sensitive and maybe are already gone before we ever looked for them. And others are pretty, seem to be pretty tolerant. So I've, in this lovely scene here, um, I found a few crayfish species in, in this habitat. My techs are really happy with me when I told them we had to sample that. Okay, the next um, threat is invasive species, and those can include fish, feral hogs, fire ants, and even probably some plants in certain circumstances. And another very big threat to crayfish species around the world is other crayfishes that are introduced. So this is the rusty crayfish that I mentioned earlier, the one that ate all the aquatic plants. And you can see in the map, the orange area is its native range in the Ohio River drainage. And then the dark red color is everywhere it's been introduced. And um, in areas where it's introduced, not only has it crashed sport fisheries, but it's also displaced the native crayfish in some of those areas. And so I wanna talk a little bit about the ways that um, that crayfish are introduced to new areas um, because I think that's a place where individuals can make a huge difference because it's often individuals that are responsible for introductions. So I'm just gonna run through a few of the ways that crayfish are introduced. The first one is from people food. So you can go online um, and buy uh, live crawfish from Louisiana and I can't tell you how many people have come up to me and told me about how, oh yeah, every time we have a crawfish boil, we let a few of them go, um, you know, and they think they're doing a good thing, but they're not because invasive crayfish can wreak havoc, not only on other crayfish, but on other, all kinds of things living in those ecosystems. Um, and they can also introduce new parasites and diseases. And it's just really a bad idea to let crayfish go. So related to the, to the human food part is aquaculture. So species are moved around for aquaculture and crayfish are very good at not staying where you put them. So if they're in an aquaculture pond, they're gonna end up in the natural environment nearby. 
Another one that people might not think about as much is the pet trade. And it's probably not as big of a source of introductions in terms of volume, but in terms of the diversity of species, it is. And you can go online and find an just astonishing array of crayfish species. Um, and this, this, this slide is from a few years ago, but um, on this slide, it said, so there was a, they had a Procambra species for sale. And for one thing, they're often misidentified on these sites. But it also said, you know, that they couldn't ship it to three states because of regulations, which is great. But that means that there was, you know, 47 states that they could ship it to. And it also says the native range is worldwide. And that's not true. The native range is only in the eastern North America. So there's lots of problems going on here. And then uh, this zebra crayfish is from Papua New Guinea. And it didn't mention any restrictions here about where it could send them. So this is really... Um, a huge concern globally, I think. Crayfish are often sold live as fish bait because if fish like to eat them, they make a good bait. Um, and several states have now outlawed the use, use or sale of live crayfish as bait, but usually that doesn't happen until after a devastating invasion and it's too late at that point. One, uh, another way that crayfish are spread that hasn't been as well documented is by fish stocking. And so if, if fish in a hatchery are raised in outdoor ponds, then when they're collected for distribution, um, sometimes crayfish are collected with them. And so crayfish, some, there's some Mississippi crayfish that we think have been introduced to Georgia by this mechanism. And last year we found a new, or we found a new invasive crayfish in Montana in a fish hatchery there. Okay, and then the, the final one is from schools. And I think this is one that people wouldn't really think about very often, but it's pretty common for uh, elementary schools, high schools to buy crayfish from one of the biological supply companies and they use them for various sorts of lessons. And then at the end of the lesson, you know, the kids have gotten attached to the crayfish and they don't wanna kill them. And so what do you do? You take the class out um, to the local pond and you release all the crayfish there. but um, that can have serious eco ecological consequences. Okay, so let's bring it back to the Wolf River and we have another poll question here. So how many crayfish species live in the Wolf River drainage? So the whole drainage, including the Mississippi part, three, 13, more than 25 or no one knows. Okay, over half of you said more than 25 and about 40% said no one knows. No one said three, good job. Okay, let's see. Answer is 13 crayfish species are known from the drainage. But I'll give you full credit if you said no one knows because no one knows. Um, so the guys working on, on Tennessee crayfish have not sampled the Wolf River thoroughly. I've sampled a little bit in the Mississippi part of it, um, but actually asking them questions about this for this talk made us make a plan to sample the drainage next spring. So I'm looking forward to that. And there's at least two other species that I'm pretty sure we'll find. And then I have, I have photos of all but one of the species, I think, from the drainage and then this is one of this faxanella is one of the ones that I think is probably there that hasn't been documented, but this is one of the dwarf grayfishes. Um, they have species that are secondary burrowers, primary burrowers, tertiary burrowers. And then there's five species of Procambrus that are documented from the drainage. And so Procambrus clarkii is the red swamp crayfish. Procambrus acutus is the white river crawfish. And these are two of the three species that you're most likely to get um, in a crawfish boil. And yeah, so that's pretty good diversity from one drainage. And these are pictures I took a few weeks ago when we were floating the, the ghost river section of the wolf. Um, 
Sometimes if you look carefully as you're floating the river, you can see these holes in the bank, you know, maybe the size of a quarter. And those are crayfish burrows. And then sometimes you'll see a chimney from the from the water, but if you get out of your boat and walk up onto the flat part of the floodplain and start looking around, you're going to see lots of chimneys up there. And a lot of times they're built like right up the side of a cypress tree or some other tree out there. And they're just all over the place. Okay, so here's our final poll question. And there is a wrong answer here. The best thing to dress up as for Halloween is a crawfish or something else. The weight is killing me. Yay, 90% of you got it right. Congratulations. The other 10% will keep working on you. Okay, so that's all I have. Happy Halloween from the Creepy Crayfish Women. And I'm happy to try to answer questions now. Thank you so much, Susie. Um, that was just wonderful. I'll go ahead and throw a question at you while I figure out how to get my video back up. So the first one is, do we know how long the females can store sperm? A season, a year or more, potentially through multiple matings or longer? Um, I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know the longest that they can store it. I know that in some species it can be months. I, I'm thinking I've read up to six months. Um, and I think there's evidence that, so they, they the male deposits the sperm and then puts a sperm plug there to prevent other males from mating with the female, but another male can come along and pull out that sperm plug and deposit his sperm. And so there's been work that's done that's shown multiple paternity for one um, crayfish litter. I don't know what you call a bunch of crayfish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there can be multiple matings for one female. That's so interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, here's another one, an invasive question. Where did the rusty crayfish come from? And I'm going to add my own question, which is once, once a drainage has been invaded by rusty crayfish, is there anything that can be done to get them out? Okay, so mo like most of the crayfish that are um, introduced in North America are from North America. And there's a reason for that I'll get, I can tell you in a minute. But so the rusty crayfish are native to the Ohio River drainage and maybe some other, maybe another drainage near there. Um, and the, the assumption is that they were moved around as fish bait. Um, so once an area is invaded, it's virtually impossible to get rid of them. Um, in some places where crayfish are introduced, where there's no native crayfish, there's been success at getting rid of them. I think that most control efforts are focused on just keeping the numbers down, but it's difficult. So the, I went to a crayfish meeting this year and um, somebody had talked about they were doing repeat um, trapping and sampling and removing the crayfish. And the more they removed, the more crayfish there were because they were moving the, removing the big ones that had been preying on the smaller ones and competing with them for food. And so when they you know, remove those, it released all more small ones to survive. So oh yeah, it, it, it really, the effort has to focus on keeping them out in the first place. And bases are just, that's such a nightmare. It really is. Um, okay, here's another question. Uh, crayfish sound like the ultimate worker. Is there any reason you wouldn't want crayfish introduced into an ecosystem? No. Well, yeah because <laughs> you don't want them, you know, you don't want them to eat a lot of what they're going to eat. Like, so you, you know, you might have snails there that serve an important role and they're going to eat all the snails and, or what's happened where the rusty crayfish were introduced, they ate all the plants and that's where the sport fish were laying their eggs and their young were rearing. And so when all the vegetation was gone, the fishery collapsed. Um, 
and that had economic consequences because people would, you know, no longer go there to fish. Um, then, uh, you know, there's more complex interactions as well. So it can affect their, like their predators. They might subsidize the diet of a predator species. And so that ends up having impacts on other things that that predator also eats. And so, you know, there, there's lots of ways documented, lots of reasons documented that they're, it's bad to introduce them, but with invasive species in general, you just don't know what's gonna happen. So it's, it's a very risky thing to introduce anything to an ecosystem. Right, it's kind of like kudzu. That's a species right. that other people might uh, recognize. Yeah, um, and I'll just, I'll add that, um, so crayfish, American crayfish were intentionally introduced to Europe um, in the early 1900s as for aquaculture reasons. And unbeknownst to the Europeans that North American crayfish carry a disease called crayfish plague. And for the most part, they don't get sick of, with it because they've evolved with it, but they carry it. And it's absolutely decimated the native crayfish in Europe. And it would even decimate them before they got there. So like, you know, somehow water, infected water would get to a lake before the crayfish actually got to the lake and it would completely kill 100% of the crayfish in the lake. And wow. you know, who knew that that was gonna happen? Nobody knew. So. Wow, that's terrible. All right, next question. On the subject of sampling the wolf for crayfish species, can you talk a little bit about sampling methods for an organism that may or may not be down a, in a burrow? <laughs> Sure. So there's lots of ways to sample for crayfish and um, the studies that have looked at, you know, the most effective approaches have shown that it's better to use more than one method. So uh, um, I, I think if we were to sample the wolf, we would probably um, do some, some seining, like, like with a big long net um, and dip netting where you just have a small handheld net that you scoop the water with. Um, we'd probably put out traps. You can put out like minnow traps with bait in them or special crawfish traps. Um, and there's also habitat traps that are like a collapsible net. And then you put some, you know, a pile of sticks or something with habitat on them and it, they just sit there. You don't have to worry about them trapping other animals. And then when you're ready to collect them, you just pull them up and the sides come up and you get any crayfish that are in there. So that's a really effective way. Um, Electrofishing works in some habitats. Um, and then the burrowers, you know, every time we're out collecting burrowing crayfish, the conversation always turns to how there has to be a better way. Um, but, you know, you can, the, the best way is just to dig out the burrow, but you can also, if you're lucky, you can um, have the, like a, they call it a yabby pump, a suction pump, and you can kind of pump the water and either the crayfish will come up or you can actually suction them out. It doesn't usually work, but sometimes it does. Um, and there's different kinds of burrow traps that you can put in the entrance of the burrow and those, they're not super effective, but they work. Um, and then there's eDNA where you can collect water samples and um, people are starting to use that more and more for crayfish to you just do a DNA assessment to see what crayfish are there. And there's, they're, some people are working right now on trying to figure out if you can take a little bit of soil from inside the burrow and use that to look for eDNA. So you can actually see what species is in there without having to dig it out, which is nice because it's because usually like if you dig out a burrow, you destroy the whole burrow. So mm -hmm. in some situations, that's not ideal. Yeah. Um, in places where there's clear water, so like I've spent the last two summers sampling in Montana and where the water's clear, we snorkeled for crayfish, which was super fun and really effective way to collect them. So you just snorkel along and you turn over rocks or look under you know, a piece of wood and you see them and you just grab them. It's very fun. Probably can't do that in the Wolf River. No, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work very well anywhere in Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, next question. Have feral hogs been documented eating crayfish? I believe they have. I think there was a study in Louisiana when they looked at um, a whole bunch of things that, that hogs were, affecting and you know they how they just go around and rototill everything and um i think that they have been documented eating crayfish and like have huge impacts on salamanders and all sorts of things wow 
Yeah, talk about, yeah, that, there's an invasive species for you, yeah. Right. Um, how did crayfish survive the winter? Um, well, that depends on where they are. In Mississippi, they just hang out. <laughs> um, places where it freezes, they either go deeper into lakes. So like up north, um, you won't find them in the very deepest part or in deep parts of the lake in the summer, but in the winter, I think that's probably where they're going. They'll, um, they'll often make shadow burrows in lakes. Um, so the, the woman I've been working with in Montana is a search and rescue diver. So last winter she was diving under the ice. In fact, I think she's on here and saw viral crayfish just hanging out in the little entrances to their burrows in the bottom of the lake, just, you know, just hanging out there. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, like up in Canada, the burrowing crayfish burrow below the frost line of the soil in the winter. So cool. And I've had, um, we actually had this, um, we, it was a growth chamber in our lab where theoretically you could control the temperature, but every once in a while it'd go haywire. And I went in there one time and it was, everything was frozen. There was ice over the top of all the aquariums and the crayfish were all upside down and not moving. And I was so upset. I thought they were all dead. And I, un, I turned off the unit and I came back a couple hours and the cray, later and the crayfish were all crawling around. <laughs> They're pretty hardy animals. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Um, what species of crayfish are found in the Sacramento Delta? The Sacramento Delta. I don't know. Um, <laughs> the native crayfish west of the Continental Divide are all, um, I'm a genus called Pacifasticus. And so they're the common name for the, the most widespread one is the signal crayfish. So I think that's what would be native there, um, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if there's now red swamp crayfish introduced there and who knows what else, maybe rusty crayfish, I'm not sure, but signal crayfish would be the native crayfish. There's only, I think there's only five, five species of Pacifasticus with a couple more that need to be described still. A much lower and, diversity and a, that was. Yeah, I think there's one species in California that's extinct and another that's on the verge of extinction. So. Oh, wow. um, how can I help the health of the crayfish in my backyard? Well, don't put arsenic in their burrows. There's, <laughs> there's a master thesis from like the 1930s and from Mississippi State where they were trying to figure out how to get rid of them. And they found that it was very effective to put arsenic in the burrow. Um, <laughs> I think that, you know, it's, it's a hard question to answer because it depends on what species it is. Um, so there are some burrowing species that are, that you really only find in like bottom line hardwood forests. And then there's other species that you only find in these, um, you know, like I mentioned earlier in the burned areas, but it turns out that mowing is a good surrogate for burning. So, you know, you'll find them in roadside ditches where it's mowed regularly and in people's lawns. So you know, I guess if you're finding them in mode areas, then it's probably good to keep that mode in kind of an early successional habitat. And if they're in forested areas, then that's probably what they're looking for. So, but yeah, it does, it does depend on the species that are there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how long do crayfish live and how long does it take for a Tasmanian crayfish to grow to 17 pounds? That's an excellent question. I don't know that. <laughs> I should know that. <laughs> but I think it takes a long time. Um, yeah, I'm, I don't know how long those Tasmanian giant crayfish live, but it wouldn't surprise me if they live 20 years. Um, crayfish are super hard to age because a lot of things like fish are aged by um, taking a spine from the fin or an ear bone and then they cross section it and count the rings like you would on a tree but crayfish don't have any bony parts. And so there's a couple methods that people have used to age them, but, um, and I'm not super up on that. I've been asked that a lot lately and I don't know, but um, so it's, it's not real clear. I would say that most of the crayfish in Mississippi live two to five years. Some of the cave crayfish, um, you know, people were used to say they would live like 15 years, but that might be an overestimate. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it, it's kind of interesting. We don't really know for a lot of them. Yeah. yeah. And I, um, I mean, I've had some in my aquariums at, at the lab for, you know, four or five years, but I don't think they would live that long in the wild usually because they would get eaten before they they live that long. I mean, you, you yeah. can look at, um, like if you go out and collect a bunch, you can see different size groups. You can get a sense of how many age classes there are. And so maybe there's like three different size groups and you wouldn't find very many of that third group. Um, mm -hmm. But the problem is that once they get bigger, their growth slows down. So it's hard to know like how many eight, how many years are actually in that biggest group. Yeah, that's it's so interesting. Um, is it legal to harvest crayfish in the Wolf River? I really don't know. Well, in Mississippi it is. I don't know. I don't know about the the Tennessee rules. My guess is yes, but you would have to look at the regulations. Um, I think most states, the general fishing regulations apply to crayfish. You know, you need a fishing license and a lot of states don't have a limit and there hasn't been very much work done on whether, cray, whether crayfish can be overfished or not. Um, hmm. There's not a lot of evidence that, that it, they're probably not easily overfished, but I'm sure at some point they could be. Yeah. Um, here's someone who wants to know if they may volunteer to help sample next spring. Oh, yeah. <laughs> how can we get in how can we um, like connect with people who want to volunteer? You can email me if you want to volunteer and I'll just start a list. So it's my email is susan.adams at usda.gov. Thank you. I may be out there uh, with you guys if I can. Um, is there a limit on how many crawfish can be eaten at boiling events? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> and is there a limit without extinction? I'm not sure if the eater or the, or the crayfish. <laughs> yeah. Um, most of the most of the crawfish that you buy live are um, from aquaculture facilities in Louisiana. Um, I think like 75% of the, of the live crawfish sold in the U.S. are from aquaculture and 25% are from the wild. Um, but even in, even in Louisiana, like the Atchafalaya Basin is where most of them are caught. And even there, they haven't studied the effects of overfishing or if there is overfishing um, because nobody wants to report to the government how many crayfish they catch. <laughs> yeah, right. um, but you know, there's no sign that they're disappearing, I guess. Yeah. And then interestingly, if you buy frozen crayfish, there's a good chance that they're not coming from here. So our red swamp crayfish have been introduced into China for aquaculture. And a lot of our frozen crayfish are our crayfish species that have been raised in China, processed, frozen, and sold back to here. And some are from Southern Spain and maybe from other places as well. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, the questions keep coming, so I'm going to keep asking until you say no more. Um, okay. <laughs> is there evidence of a natural shift of species across areas? For example, are there species naturally shifting east or west, excluding human introduction? Wow, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, there's a there's a species, a primary burrowing species in along the Gulf Coast that I suspect that's happening with it, but I don't have evidence. Um, I'm trying to think if there's other examples of that. You know, we definitely have examples of species spreading, but we don't we don't necessarily know if it's from people or if it's happening naturally. So that's one problem with answering that. And the other problem is that most states don't have historical good historical crayfish data. So that's a huge frustration in trying to study them is that we don't know what used to be there. So it's hard to figure out how things have changed. Like, so even though, like I talked about some of the crayfish that are endemic to a small area and you can use genetic approaches to figure out if they used to have a bigger range, but you know, it's hard to really know if they, if that's natural or, or not. Yeah. So I know it's a really good question and um, yeah, maybe the answer is out there, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, are crayfish nocturnal? Yes. So 
Um, you know, again, it depends on the species, but um, I would say a lot of species are more active at night than they are during the day. Um, a lot of burrowers will come out at night, especially on like a warm, humid or rainy night, especially after a right after a storm. Um, and then there's a lot of aquatic species that are, you know, they're hidden away all day. And sometimes, you know, if you're camping or by a river at night, you can just, you know, like throw a little piece of cheese or something out there and watch with your flashlight and I'll come out and I'll do it in the day some, but they'll do it a lot more at night. So <laughs> it's so cool. fun to see. <laughs> Okay, this, this is a very good question. The spatial patterns of crayfish diversity is super interesting. How do we know that the lower numbers of crayfish species in South America, Africa, and Asia are not due to lack of surveys in those areas? Hmm. Well, I guess because when people have gone out intentionally looking, they're not finding anything. So, and not to say there couldn't be some more, but, but people have definitely looked. Um, so I, I know one biologist, Chris um, Taylor went to, I'm trying to remember what country he went to in South America looking for, for new, to see if he could find new crayfish species. And he, he spent you know, a fair amount of time there sampling and didn't find any. Um, Africa, so there's, there's species that are native to Madagascar that are still there, but not in mainland Af Africa. And, so people don't really know if it's because they were never there or if they just got extirpated by humans eating them. Um, but there are a number of introduced species in Africa, including our red swamp crayfish, of course, which is everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's, yeah, very interesting. Uh, what is the biggest crayfish species in North America? I'm not sure. I think it, um, there's a couple species of Barbie Camberus that are, um, in, I want to say, say Tennessee, Alabama, um, one of which was only described a few years ago. And I think those might be the biggest. Um, I've never actually seen them. And, you know, a lot of times when we describe new species, um, there's a species complex. So there's a species that everybody, so like say the devil crayfish, all throughout North America, there was devil crayfish. And then um, when my Algon started studying them and, you know, look, do, looking at the morphology and the DNA, he ended up splitting it into a bunch of different species. But every once in a while, somebody discovers something that's really a new species. And one of these Barbie Canberras that was described fairly recently was like that. And so it was like this great big crayfish that nobody had ever seen before, which is pretty cool. Hmm, cool. And that um, the Pasifasticus or signal crayfish out west, th they get pretty big. <laughs> That was the other reason it was fun sampling for them. They get definitely bigger than most of the crayfish in Mississippi. That's really cool. Um, the, uh, this next question, I'm not sure. Well, I'll just read it out. Are they native or invasive? Both. I'm not sure if they, if you mean just crayfish in North America. Yeah, I mean it depends on where you are, right? So. The, the species counts that were on that first map, like 460 species in North America, those are native species. Right. We're, and and the reason we, there are, um, so people have brought in some of the, Aust so the, Australia has, they have those Tasmanian giant crayfish, but they also have other species that are like pretty good sized crayfish. Like they actually cook them, you know, one crayfish across the barbecue, like a row of them. Um, so people have brought those to North America for aquaculture, and there are a couple examples of wild established populations of them, which is unfortunate, but that crayfish plague that I mentioned before is one thing that keeps us from having very many invasive crayfish from other continents because they're subject, you know, they can die of the crayfish plague, whereas the native crayfish probably aren't for the most part. Oh, interesting. Um, let's see, I think this is right. Chrysarinus hortoni is in the hatchy system. Any chance they will appear in the wolf? Ah, uh, well, that's a good question. Cause when I asked um, Jeff and Carl, if that, if that species was there, they said they thought it's probably not in the wolf, but I don't know, that would be cool to find. Huh, cool. 
And I've tried um, to find it in North Mississippi a couple times and haven't had any luck, but I don't know if it's just, there's not, like when you get up near the Tennessee border, there's not a lot of um, public land, accessible public land in the in the right habitat. So it's possible that they're there somewhere. Mm. Um, I'll send you an email about later on about that. Um, how okay. well does eDNA sampling work for crayfish? This is the same person asking about Crisir about Horton I. Um, it works well. You have to develop the, the markers first. And I think that's the you know the issue that a lot of people have because it yeah in developing the DNA markers, um, you know, there's an upfront cost there. And so especially because there's such specios systems, you have to come up with a lot of markers, but you know, it works fairly well. And there's some reason to believe that um, you can get a, a fair indication of abundance from that as well. Um, some of the work that's tested it has found some false positives, which is probably more of a methodological issue, but, uh, but yeah, I think there's, a, there's a lot of potential for it. It's really and it's cool. being used and it's being used in Europe for a number of things as well, a number of applications. And they also have eDNA, um, assays for crayfish plague there. That is really cool. I didn't know it was used for crayfish. I know it was used for amphibians. Um, anyway. Um, this is a question from a child, and no apologies necessary, Jessica. Is it a true act to suck their brains out while eating them? Is it a what act? A true act. A true act. Well, it's definitely something you can do. <laughs> <laughs> I used to do it, but then I learned that um, all, like there's certain kind of toxins, like um, well, I don't know, maybe mercury stored in the muscle, but other toxins like metals that are that crayfish will store and those are stored in the, it's called a green gland, which is in the, what you're calling that, what you suck the head, it's in that part of the crayfish. And so if you suck the head, you're getting most of the pollutants that might be in the crayfish. So I don't do that anymore. <laughs> that is very valuable information. Yeah, it really is. Okay, do we have an idea of what the typical range size is for North American crayfish? Wow, these are such hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't think there is a typical range. I mean, I, you could come up with an average, but one of the problems with that is that most of the species that are super widespread are, you know, at some point they're getting broken up into multiple species. Um, and that kind of depends on if, if a taxonomist is a lumper or a splitter, but, um, you know, it's really a huge range for, like I said, from one cave to, you know, pretty gigantic drainages. So I wouldn't even know where to start to, to say what a typical range size is. Yeah. Okay, here's another typical question. How many crayfish typically share a burrow? Ah, uh, that's a good question. So usually there's one in a burrow, but um, sometimes you'll find a male and a female in a burrow, especially during the breeding season. And I have found a crayfish, like a female crayfish with two different age classes, I think, of, of juveniles. And that was during a drought. So I don't know if that was the norm for that species or if that was unusual just because everything was so dry. Um, but the other problem with answering that question is that when, you, when you're digging out a crayfish burrow, if you dug down five feet and you, you have to make the hole bigger so you can get your shoulder down in it and you get a crayfish and you're so psyched, usually you're not going to keep digging. <laughs> so, you know, I think if you really want to answer that question, you have to make sure that you've dug to the absolute bottom of the burrow every time. But I have, you know, I, I found, and I know other people that have found two crayfish in a burrow sometimes. And they'll also, they'll use each other's burrows. So like if everybody's out feeding at night and the sun comes up and they're racing back to a burrow, they'll they'll go in somebody else's burrow. And I, I assume if the, somebody else is in there, they'll try to kick out the intruder. But yeah, yeah. I've kind of wondered in places where there's tons of burrows, I've kind of wondered if they're not kind of interconnected down there, like big, you know, crayfish nightclubs underground or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's that's yes, we've got to go, we've got to follow that thread somewhere. Okay. 
In all of your time collecting crayfish, which species was the most difficult for you to catch? Mm. I, I mean, I guess it would have to be some of the burrowers. Mm -hmm. um, well, maybe there, there's a, one of the dwarf crayfishes is Camborellus diminutus, and I have yet to collect it. I've gone looking at in places where it's supposed to be in, along the coast and I haven't found it yet. So maybe that would be the most difficult. Okay. Okay, here's our aquatic, uh, aquatic biologist question. Uh, uh, Procambrus acutus is now established in the headwaters of Mill Creek in Williamson County, Tennessee. Should Faxonius shupai be concerned? Wow. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, David. I think, think shupai should be that. concerned about a lot of things. Um, yeah. yeah, and so. David, you might yeah. want to email Susie later about, um, you know, you have a lot of uh, really good questions to discuss. So. Yeah. Um, let's see. Do crayfish have a mating call? If not, can they make any sound at all? They can make sound. I've heard them make sound. I mean, it's not like a call so much. It's kind of like little bubbly squeaky noises i think they're maybe you put them in an aquarium and put the food in and watch them they're little they have all these different mouth appendages that are just like constantly moving around and so you take them out of the water and they keep doing that and they make little noises and but as far as like a communication sound um not that i'm aware of but who knows mm -hmm. i don't know if anybody's tried to figure that out or not <laughs> Is being an estecologist as much fun as it appears to be? Oh yeah. So I haven't mentioned it, but the unfortunate name for those who study crayfish is astecologist <laughs> because <laughs> the you know astecidia is the what super family. Um, yeah, but it's fun. Okay, uh, last three questions. Do you have a favorite crayfish? Oh, it's like asking if I have a favorite child. Um, <laughs> Procambrus lanyap is in the, um, like the lower Tom Bigby in Mississippi and Alabama. And I, I haven't collected it in a long time, but I really like it. It's really pretty. Um, yeah. And some of the burrowers are really cool. But I, I don't know, it's hard to pick just one. I know. It's funny that the burrowers are some of the most colorful crayfish, which is very strange because they spend their life in a dark burrow and then they come out at night and it's like, why are they colorful? It's kind of a mystery, but that is so interesting. They can yeah. be really pretty. Um, how long does it take a crayfish to dig one of the deep burrows? Um, that's another good question. I don't know. I mean, it they can burrow pretty quick, surprisingly quickly. Um, but I don't think they're usually just setting out to dig a burrow and dig down six feet. You know, they might dig down a foot deep and then as things dry out and the water drops, they're digging deeper and, and they'll actually like, they'll backfill some of their tunnels at certain times of the year. And so it's, it's a very dynamic system and I don't really know how long it takes them to dig a, a really deep one. And it depends on the soil too. I'm sure some soil is a lot easier for them to dig in than others. Mm -hmm. What sort of courtship do crayfish have? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, they're not super discriminating. If you can catch them at the right time of year and put them in the bucket, and next time you look, they're in their mating. So it's not like it's a some long, prolonged get to know you scene. Um, but I'm sure you know. There's chemical cues. I think there's visual cues. Um, there's probably behavioral cues. And it's kind of surprising that more hasn't been done on research, behavioral research on that. I think it's, you know, it's a kind of a cool um, opportunity to do some neat behavioral and mate choice selection kind of research. Mm -hmm. And there could be all kinds of things going down, going hap happening underground, right? Yeah, who In knows? a nightclub. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so 
Finally, one last biologist question from Dave. Uh, yes, party foul on acutus versus shupii, he says. How about this? Lacuna cambris acanthura appears to guard their burrow entrance. Why? Like a trapdoor spider? Um, my guess is that, so there's definitely burrowers that will just hang out in the entrance of their burrow and they're being like sit, uh, sit and wait predators. So they're just hanging out there when a, some kind of insect or something comes by, they're, they're nabbing it. So my guess is that that's what's going on. There could also be, I guess, instances where they're, you know, waiting to come out or keeping other things from coming in because there are things that will eat crayfish that will go into the burrow. So. It's probably easier to stop something at the entrance, but I bet a lot of it is um, predation. Yeah, that's cool. Well, that was a marathon of great questions. Thank you, everybody. And Susie, this was just wonderful. I learned so much. And um, I've got to well, get out there you. and sample with you sometime. Thanks for all the great questions, everyone. That was fun. Yeah, that was wonderful. Um, so I'm going to let you go. and. Um, Thank everyone again. Remember, we've got our Greenway Soiree coming up on November 5th, our big fundraiser. We'd love to have you attend. Um, and look for an email with a link to this recording uh, probably next week. So thank you, Susie. Hope to see you soon. Thanks. Bye, Bye. all. Bye-bye.